Hi everyone, welcome to another Half Time Club. A little bit of a break um, since the last one. Hopefully everyone is well. Um, weather's getting better as well and it's getting lighter in the evening. So hopefully, uh, yeah, out on the grass or the astroturf, turf um, and you enjoy that little bit extra light. Um, so today's topic is around being creative. Um, and this is quite a difficult topic to sort of talk about really on an online um, session, but we're going to give it the best shot, as we always do. Lots of opportunities to put questions in and use the Q&A function, also the use of a poll. Um, so fingers crossed, um, lots of engagement and um, yeah let's get cracking on. So as usual our sort of workshop breakdown so we'll look at the principles of play and where creativity may fit in within that. We'll break down what creativity is and what we think it might be. We'll look why creativity is something that's quite complex to speak about and actually you know design into your sessions. The role of the coach in supporting the development of creative players zooming into a little bit of detail around what creativity might be and actually how it might affect some of the football actions you see on the pitch, as well as designing a session that we can work on creativity. And then finally, some considerations when out on the grass when coaching. So as usual, the principles of play underpin everything we do. So when we have the ball and we're attacking, we're looking to penetrate, use creativity, use movement, support play and create space. And when we don't have the ball when we're defending, we're looking to possibly delay, press, be patient, provide cover, be compact and get the balance correct. As usual, all these principles of play are online um, for the England Learning website. Um, and I would encourage you to use the QR code on the screen to have a little look if you haven't already. It's really important to remember that the principles of play exist no matter what game of football you watch. However, they can be applied in varying ways depending on your style of play. <clears throat> So, for example, if we look at creativity, Brazil may choose to show greater flair and variety within their movements, whereas a team like Italy may show, show more of a structured and controlled movements in their play. So that's just something we can think about just to sort of um, prime our thoughts. They're also oh. a useful way to... Do oh, yes, go on, Louise. Just quickly, I don't think the slides are moving. Oh, is it not moving at all? No, mine's still stuck on the first one. Can everyone in the um, room just put a thumbs up if your slides are moving and you should see the principles of play on the screen? If not, um, yeah, so thumbs up if you, you can see them. Perfect. It might just be you, Eloise. That's okay. That's okay. Perfect. So, yeah, the principles of play are a useful way to diagnose problems in the game. So, as we've mentioned in previous webinars, you know, if we look at, look at a game of football and we're not seeing um, penetration, we're not going to score. So we need to be able to go and impact penetration to help that team go and score some goals. It's also important to recognise that these principles don't exist in isolation and then separately to each other. They are constantly working together to help you out on the grass. So, first question of the day what does creativity mean to you so use the q a function at the top of the page you see a little um, speech bubble with a question mark in what does creativity mean to you Just going to reshare Mark in case you can't see it, and we'll. Uh... Hopefully, everyone can see that now on the screen. So Mark shared freedom to express yourself on the pitch. Paul shared players making their own decisions. Barry speaking about variation in play. Richard shared being able to create something from a restricted situation where you are marked closely, for example. Gavin shared players create an opportunity to score, bring other players into play. Mark shared about flair, something a little different to break down the opponent.
David said, having the ability as a team to create patches of planned decisions, um, we might make as individual. Well, so thanks everyone. So I think looking from that is actually quite a wide range of um, descriptions as to what creativity is, especially in a football setting. And I think what we're going to do, we're going to look at creativity from a slight wider focus to start with, like a wider lens. So when we break down creativity, this is the dictionary's definition of it. So it's the ability to produce or use original and unusual ideas. So it is therefore important to consider how we can use different techniques within football to produce these original and unusual ideas. However, it's not that simple. So we know we have passing, receiving, traveling, finishing, turning, intercepting, pressing and marking, challenging, covering and recovering. There's so many things, but like I said, it's not that simple. According to the FA's principles of play, creativity exists as an attacking principle alone. However, by the definition above, it can also simply just exist within the game, <clears throat> irrespective of whether we're attacking or defending. If creativity is seen as taking a new and novel approach to something, then we may be missing a trick simply keeping it as an attacking principle of play. So using the Q&A function and looking at the two teams here, so we have Brazil on the left hand side and we have Germany on the right hand side. Can you describe the culture and style of both these teams? So we're going to dive a little bit deeper into what creativity might be from a cultural point of view to start with. So use the Q&A function, describe the culture and style of both these teams. And where might creativity fit within them descriptions? So Cole shares Brazil all about individual flair, Germany about defence and solidity and doing things in a structured way. Thanks, Cole. Barry shared, Brazil having more flair, individual moments of skill. Germany, more structure, less risk, more efficient. Mark shared, higher risk as individuals and the team for Brazil. Germany, solid, strategic. Mark shared, similar around players given a lot of freedom when in possession of the ball. More like a maverick, yet good word to use. Germany, perhaps more structure and certain patterns of play that they use to break teams down. Yeah, Gavin shared about flair skills being bold for Brazil, Germany, organised, compact, cautious. Thanks everyone for sharing. So I think it's really important then to therefore consider the impact that culture has on our perceptions of what creativity is and isn't. So, for example, in Brazil, if we're saying that flair and skills are something which is natural in their culture, is that then deemed as creative in their setting, in their environment? or is what they do in Brazil, that's the norm. In Germany, for example, something that could be relatively simple in Brazil might be deemed as something very creative in the German culture of football. So I think it's really important to consider that culture has a massive impact on what, how we define creativity and what we decide is and isn't creative. So again, looking at creativity is complex. So to the right, is an image of Dick Fosby. I'm not sure how many of you will be aware of Dick Fosby. You can always put a little thumbs up in the um, in the chat if you're aware of him. So 
he, in the high jump, he fashioned the jumping style now known as the Fosby flop. Okay, so before this, jumpers jump forwards over the bar, often with a scissor jump or forwards because they wanted to attempt to land safely on their feet. Now, with the advent of deep foam matting, Dick Fosby saw an opportunity to develop a different style. So the style you see nowadays where they go backwards first is a style that wasn't prevalent originally. So it sounds odd, but creativity stems from an element of control and order. Creativity, therefore, is also the ability to interact with something from a different perspective to which existed previously. So consequently, the opportunities and boundaries we allow players to experiment and explore within will likely define the bandwidth of creative possibilities that are there for them to use. So just because you perceive a certain opportunity as a coach, the likelihood is that the another person, your player, may perceive a different opportunity within that same environment. So the same equipment might be there. The same gaps on the pitch might exist. You might play one way or see one thing, but another player might see another. So, And we're not always going to be aware of that, but people are going to see opportunities in different ways, even though the same things are present in front of them. So therefore, the same stuff, not a great English, but the same stuff is there. But how we choose to interact with this stuff or these things can be highly different depending on the individual and how they're brought up, for example. So what does it look like in relation to football? <clears throat> so sometimes when we work with younger players, so this graph here on the left hand side. So on the left hand, you know, the Y axis on the, the tall column, we've got age and development. And on the bottom axis, we've got experiences, variation, in size of skill set. Now, often how it may look is with younger people, we want them to work with a very narrow and defined set of techniques. And we might do this, you know, for, for obvious reason, we might want them to get really good at certain things like passing, like dribbling. But we might work on specific surfaces of the foot only or specific ways of doing that. Now, the problem with that is actually we might be unintentionally narrowing the opportunities that we provide players to go and be creative with different use surfaces of the foot, different ways of moving, different ways of passing, for example. So if we narrow the bandwidth of opportunities of our players that we allow them to explore too early, we could unintentionally be restricting our players from being adaptable, exciting, effective and dynamic. So I would like to think most of us, if we go and watch a football game, we'll get off our seats when a player does something amazing. Therefore, the question is what environment has to be created for these exciting and dynamic behaviours to emerge? So really what we kind of want it to look like, we want to give players everything. We want them to get to explore different ways of doing stuff. You know, doesn't mean that we can't still practice certain things and become good at them, but we need to make sure there are opportunities for players to practice outside of that order and control because creativity stems from actually fighting the system a little bit. It's doing something outside of what everyone expects. So let's just consider what we allow players to do in training and in practice and what techniques we may get them to explore because if we widen their pool available to them to use, like just going forwards, they're going to start selecting the things they enjoy from a bigger range of tools and when they get older they'll probably narrow their tool set based on what they enjoy or actually they'll keep it as wide as possible and you'll end up having players that have a lot of skill a lot in their toolbox that they can use to exploit situations in the game so the coach's role in this is really key so some of you may be familiar with the model in the top right of the screen that some of you might have seen it on your A4C courses some of you may be familiar with other courses as well all this is is a planning model. It's something that we ask coaches to consider when they plan their sessions, but we're not going to go too much in detail. But what we're going to say is how you engage your players, which is the top square, is really important. So if we want them to go and explore a wider range of opportunities, technical options, things like that, for example, we need to be sure that they're ready to do it. They're going to enjoy it. There's no pressure on them. So they're worried about the consequence of trying new things. That also links into the coach behaviour, which is on the left hand side. We want the coach to ensure that they create an environment where the player feels there are safe opportunities to learn. And that is really key. You don't want uncertainty in what they do. They want to be certainty in terms that you're going to be there to support them. Also links into your practice design. So what you put in your practice and what you deliver is going to have an effect on what they're able to practice and explore. So if we narrow again the opportunity too much, they're going to work a very narrow and defined set of skills. And that links into your outcome. So that intended outcome is just what am I trying to get better at? What am I trying to help my players get better in training today? Again, so if I want them to get better at one small thing, 
then I may unintentionally be narrowing the other opportunities. But we're going to go into a bit more detail. So what are the bandwidth of opportunities? And what I mean by bandwidth, imagine you've got a radio station and you've got all the different channels and the stations and you, and you turn the knob left and right. You know, you've got loads of stations. If we only have three, that bandwidth narrows up. So what are the bandwidth opportunities you are allowing or supporting your players to interact with in training? How do you, as a coach, support your players to find these different solutions? Does your practice design only allow for one solution for them to practice, a few or many? And what I mean by that is, if we play a game, for example, and there's no restrictions at all, then the players are probably going to have lots of different ways to practice things. If we have a practice where they're just working at passing and receiving, we are narrowing the amount of solutions they have. If we have a practice on passing and receiving, but we say we want to use different techniques, then we might be increasing that. So just something to consider in your practice design. So without giving answers away, it's just something, a deeper thought process behind why we do what we do. And do you understand the possibilities that are there for players to explore? And all this means is as a coach, we should know all the technical stuff. The players don't need to know we know that, but if we know what all the options might be, we can help nudge people's attention along to say, have you tried this? Have you thought of it this way? Because that's how people will get more creative. They have We have to guide their attention to new things they may not have explored before. So this links in then to the skill capabilities. So some of you again might be familiar with this. It'll be on the England Learning website. Um, have a little look. So if you're not familiar, um, technique, positioning, movement, timing, deception, scanning, and all these ingredients can be manipulated and used in different ways to the, the end goal being creative outcomes, ways to exploit the opponent differently in varying ways to get different levels of success. Because at the end of the day, if we do the same thing over and over again, the best players will work it out and we might not have the solutions to solve the next problem. So if we think about technique, for example, which highlighted in here, can just think of in your head a little bit at the moment. We're going to go into a bit more detail, open up the Q&A in a mo. Just think about what different ways and different techniques are there available for players to use? What different positions on the pitch can they take up, which could be quite creative to affect things? So, and you think about what we see nowadays with Trent Alexander-Arnold, for example, going into midfield. You know, the traditional positions may not be prevalent in the game in the future. So what? how are we supporting our players to be effective in that? A centre-back nowadays may be expected to rotate with their midfielders. Are we providing opportunities for our players to practice these, these moments? And I don't mean them just starting in midfield, but they may start in defence and end up in midfield in the game. So these things, again, to consider. The movements of players, it might not just be one or two movements. You might have to make three or four in the modern game because players are becoming more athletic and able to stay with players and track them. More teams might go player for player. So all these things, again, think about all the opportunities there are. Timing. Do I do it early? Do I do it late? Deception. And deception links very well into creativity because if I can hide what I'm trying to go after, I'm likely going to get away with it a bit more because I'm selling a dream to someone and actually not going through with it. And then scanning. Scanning is often something we teach players to look for what they want to do, but actually we could be really creative and use a scan to trick someone to thinking we're looking somewhere, but go another way. Michael Carrick's a great example of a player that did that very well. He'd look one way and pass another. So all we're trying to do here is just look at creativity as a broader topic and what take a wider lens, more philosophical and say, do you understand all the ways there are to be creative in the game? So on that, so we've got a poll that Eloise will now open up and launch on the uh, Q&A. So can you think about the different ways? And we're going to narrow the question down so it's quite familiar to everyone. Can you list the different ways and techniques there are to pass a football? So the poll should now be live for you to access. So can you try and use one word answers where possible? Two at the most. And hopefully what we'll do, we'll start to collate everyone's thoughts and we'll get a little word cloud forming so everyone can see it.
really good engagement everyone keep going hopefully you can see that word cloud forming on your screen Yeah, brilliant. Well done, everyone. So we'll just look at the workout at the moment. So we've got inside of the foot, outside of the foot, instep, heel, left foot, right foot, different parts of the body lofted in the air, a stronger pass, a weaker pass, a rabona, a chip, drilled. So hopefully you can start to appreciate that there's so much variety that's out there in terms of how we can do something. So I'm just going to go through on the next page some of the ways that the FA have presented. Um, some of you may be familiar with this on the UAPC technical guide in terms of some of the ways you may pass the ball. Again, this, is, this list is not exhaustive, but hopefully it just gets you to think about the variety of things we have to uh, consider as a coach. So we've got inside of the foot, outside of the foot, instep. So if you're not familiar with the instep, it's just the arch part or the top of the boot, uh, top of the foot, sorry. Lift the ball, back heel, curled, driven, chipped, lofted, volleyed, half volley. So just imagine if this is what we're speaking about here, imagine all the other techniques that are possible for all the other actions of sense you traveling with the ball, turning, you know, challenging, intercepting across the board. So you know, even within it, we can even break these down even further. You know, a driven pass is in the air. It could be a driven pass that's on the floor, on the ground. It can be a chipped ball over distance, a chipped in a small way. It might be chip over the foot, a chip over the knee, a chip over multiple players. So what I'm trying to get across here, there's only 17 laws of the game which define how the game can be played. The rest of it is open to interpretation. There are no other rules which dictate how you should and shouldn't pass a ball. There are some really effective ways of doing stuff and we're not saying you should not work at players working on the inside of the foot because that is the most effective and regular way of passing but all we're trying to get to do here is, is recognize there are different ways we can support players to practice different techniques and the fact that we've highlighted so many here already shows you that there's no rule that tells you how you should pass a ball and just think about all the other ways finishing for example well done everyone thanks for that so what ingredients may support or restrict creativity so hopefully the previous slides have highlighted that the environment we create is key to supporting creative players and it's based on culture it's based on what we allow players to do therefore rather than showing you a best practice for example for developing creativity because sometimes what we do is we go can i have a practice of creativity but hopefully what we've highlighted here is actually it's the environment which is key we will discuss how we can deliberately manipulate the methods we use and the messages we share with our players to bring about creativity whilst also considering what may intentionally come as a consequence of what we do and say so i guess if we had to look at it, is that what ingredients are within our creativity recipe. So we're building that creativity cake. What ingredients do we need to consider? So the first thing, and this is very familiar, hopefully, to a lot of you in terms of the step model. So that's around space, task, equipment and people. So if I want to increase creativity, utilising and manipulating space, I may consider using different size areas. So I may have a long and wide area, a long and narrow, short and wide, short and narrow, and a circular space. Again, this list is not exhaustive, but what I want you to get to, you want you to consider now is can you just pick one or two area or shapes and discuss how it may impact someone's creativity? So just pick one or two and just think about what does that shape area probably bring to life more for certain players? So imagine you're just playing a game, what might it do? So use the Q&A function to pick one or two area shapes and discuss how it may impact creativity for them players and what things might you expect to see from them shapes.
So Lee shared that a circle will encourage the player to look and use all directions. Also, a short and narrow pitch will make it harder to pass, definitely. Shane shared about the long and narrow makes movement more important. Carl said long and wide give people more time to work on a particular creative idea. So I think if it's long and wide, it probably looks more like the game anyway, because that's the shape of the pitch. Mark said circle, no one direction. Yeah, we're able to, to change focus at a drop of a hat. Brilliant. So if I want to get players not to be able to hide in a corner, to be constantly involved in the practice, a circle may actually increase the levels of attention, levels of creativity they need to employ in that moment. Barry shed long and wide on the ball, using the space to stretch opponents. Yes. Jack shed long and narrow, promote direct passes forward. Brilliant. So if I want to bring to life forward passes and penetration, I might take, you know, I might use a long and narrow pitch to promote this. And think about all again, different passes, that he's lofted, lifted, over the top, chipped. Short and wide, Jack said about the switches of play. Yeah, brilliant. Gavin shared around long and wide may encourage more longer balls. Short and narrow may encourage less touch of the ball when passing between each other. David said that a circle might probably support more ball mastery. Long and wide, creative pass or using pace in the creative to take a player on. Short and wide will force the player to find space, which probably will be out wide. Brilliant. Yeah. So I think the key thing here, like I think Mark inhibits the player's options. Again, what we're trying to do is narrow their attention towards something, narrow their focus as players. However, we're still giving them opportunities to explore different solutions. So what I've not said in any of these shapes is you have to pass the ball out wide, for example, in a short and wide. But the space is available to use should you feel it's necessary to use it. So hopefully there's quite a clear difference between that. It's not a rule that the ball must go wide. What it is, there's space is available there. I've took away the depth to then encourage wider movements and wider decisions, but you don't have to use it. And that's what creativity is. It's providing the players the opportunity to explore opportunities that they value and they see. Your job as a coach is to recognise it and nudge them along. Thanks, everyone. So just going to move on now to um, the next bit. So task. So I want you now to think about the following and how it may impact upon creativity. So discuss to what effect the following challenges posed to the players may have on the number of solutions they can try in the practice. So. These are two challenges that some of us may use. I want you to think about the difference between them. So the number of passes, passes before you score equals the value of your goals. The number of seconds you stay on the ball before you score equals the value of the goals. So think about, first of all, what does it do? What, what does it make the players think about? But also what impacts may it have on creativity, whether positive or possibly negative?
So Shane has shared number of passes should promote creativity around switching and distributing the ball as often as possible. Paul said that number of passing may improve the skill technique of passing, whereas number of seconds possibly may going more realistic, encourages possession under pressure. So Mark said number of passes might downgrade the option of dribbling, so players will focus on team play, not individual. Gavin said number of passes, team will try to maintain it as long as possible. Seconds will drive individuals to maintain it as long as possible as well. Number of seconds will challenge a player to find new ways of keeping the ball before they are tackled, positive for the individual, maybe not for the team. Number of seconds promotes getting the ball up the pitch as quick as possible, forces players to be more direct. Passes encourages players to collaborate more and seek ways to pass. Time on the ball would be more creative, in my view, because you get the passes and ball retention through other means. I think that's the key thing, and thanks for that, Joe. So, I think what we're recognising here is no—it's just a way of put, posing a challenge to players. But we have to recognise what we're trading off, and the, the best coaches know why they're doing something and what they're trading off at what time. So, if I am rewarding players for the number of passes they make, they are probably likely going to make passes for the sake of passes because they know that will have an impact on the scoreline. Are they necessarily going to be making the most creative and best decisions in relation to what's going on? Maybe not. But if I want to bring about lots of practice to pass him, that might be what I want to do. The number of seconds, however, again, it's it still encourages spending time on the ball, but I've opened up the opportunities for the players to explore. So I've opened up the technical options. They can still pass. They can dribble now, though, and they can they can dribble backwards. They can play loads of different things they can do, but they are still being encouraged to stay on the ball. So both challenges encourage the team to stay on the ball, but they differ in terms of how or what opportunities may be there to do it. And this links in similarly with, you know, if you want to encourage fast play, for example, and we say, right, you need to make a couple of passes before you can score, then actually what you're doing is taking away that opportunity to exploit things quickly. If you're saying everyone must touch the ball before we can score, Again, you may be taking away opportunities for players to get into higher positions earlier and taking the finish themselves. So all we're saying is just recognise what you're trading off. So what gets rewarded will get repeated. So that's something, a really key thing to take away. So next one, equipment. Now, this is a really interesting one and um, we might put a little bit of a curveball um, into the arena. So. What other ways could we use different types of equipment to encourage creativity? And this is what I want you to think about. Rugby balls, tennis balls in training, a beach ball, for example, hoping it's not windy. So there's just a couple of examples. So you use the Q&A function. Just think about how we could use different types of equipment to encourage creativity and actually what impact might it have. So, for example, a rugby ball, just think about what might you know encourage players to do. A tennis ball, what might it be in its size and it's, you know, might not be as bouncy? What might it get players to think to do? So just think about how we use different types of equipment. And you may think of other equipment that you might, um, might want to talk about as well. So Lee said that a beach ball might encourage players to come short. Yeah, because if it moves quite wildly, people have to find different ways to do it using it. Mark's got poles, bibs, cones, obstacles. They have to be finding ways around them. Goals, you can actually keep the goals moving, so they have to constantly adapt. Lee said tennis balls could encourage nutmegs. 
Uh, Mark said, we play a netball tournament with a tennis ball to encourage movement and finding space. Shane said, using smaller balls can help focus on small movements and finer ball control. Yes, yeah, so if you have an individual maybe that struggles to, you know, keep a larger ball under control, a tennis ball may actually really narrow up, you know, their skill set into a tighter space in their body, which may then help them get tidier technique and, you know, better, like I said, finer motor control, as mentioned. Will Davis said that a rugby ball has an unknown bounce would slow players down trying to dribble and to think more about how they get the ball from A to B 100% so yeah a rugby ball might be a really good way of getting players to really focus on the ball when they're dribbling just to kind of think about where they're contacting it and stuff like that and it might be a good way to you know something fun but introduce that focus and that attention some players who maybe aren't so comfortable on the ball might not need to look up so soon. They might actually need to look at the ball and how their contact to start with. And a rugby ball might be a really good way of doing that. And when they start to get a little bit confident, then we can get them and their eyes will naturally raise up, rise up when they get more confident traveling with the ball. When people say eyes up quite early on in a young player's development, but actually we might want to give them that chance of actually looking at the ball to start with and seeing how it moves with different touches. It's no different when you do your driver lessons to start with. You know, you're looking at everything, eventually become really relaxed and you can just focus on a really small amount of things on the road rather than looking at everything. And all of a sudden, it's like your car becomes an extension of your arm. So again, it's just recognising that process. Yeah, Carl said also the bounce, you know, might take place to react to the situation differently. Yeah, so it's not so obvious is it what's going to happen. So we may get some different defending returns, we may get some different ways of attacking, things like that. Thanks, everyone. So we'll look at people next. So we've mentioned previously around sort of these sort of things. So you might have a team with an overload. You might have a team with an underload. Um, you might decide to match them up. So you've got equal numbers of both teams. You might decide to go fully opposed, semi-opposed. You might say you can only intercept, not tackle. Or you might say no opposition at all. Um, and these are only, again, it's not an exhaustive list, but I hope it just gets you to recognise that the way I place and the way I organise people on the pitch might bring about different ways of being creative. So, for example, a semi-opposed team that's trying to intercept the ball only because they can't tackle may help players that just want to go and smash into it, for example, find different creative ways of getting the ball back because they know they can't tackle. That's been taken away from them now. So they've got to find a different solution to win the ball back. So again, it's just recognising what are your players' needs. And sometimes I may have to trade off a little bit of realism, but it might actually encourage them to be a bit more creative in their solutions. On the other hand, I might want to have no opposition. I want to give players the chance, for example, to practice different techniques and skills in a safe setting where there's no consequence of losing the ball, because actually I might want to get them safe, feel safe and enjoy trying different things. Some of them might not want to try different parts of the foot, for example, because you know, their parents might say, don't do this, or this is not what you do. And these unwritten rules of football don't help young people. But if we give them a safe space to practice a chip or a scoop or a back heel or a volley, for example, using some of the terms we used previously, that might be a good way to do it. So again, it's just a way, but begin to understand why you do what you do and what impact it might have and what am I trading off? So some, some considerations when coaching. So be considerate of the impact of our language. Now, I say this on every single webinar, but hopefully this comes a bit more um, obvious now within this. So if we're saying creativity is something which is cultural, it's what we, the environment we create, it's based on, you know, breaking down structure a little bit and finding new, novel solutions or different perspectives to things, then we have to be careful. We don't say some hard, fast rules with our players that they can't break. So if we say, for example, every pass must be inside of the foot, we might be limiting the opportunity to practice different things. Yes, we still want them to be good at using the inside of the foot, but we have to understand that there are other ways of doing things. Also, if we say number of passes equals number of goals, again, the language we're using, we're not doing it intentionally to stop them doing things, but actually we're not realising the impact of the language we use. So again, really be considerate of why you say what you say and what it will do to your players. 
not mentioned within this because we generally spoke in general, but the role of the goalkeeper in this as well. So when we speak about creativity, you know, there are players and goalkeepers we can think of in the past, you know, Peter Schmeichel and other players that have different ways of saving things, different ways of catching things. There is no hard rule. There are some effective ways of doing things, but there could be lots of different techniques. So Edison, for example, in terms of his distribution on the ball, you know, you could argue she's highly creative, but actually that could be something really normal in their culture. So again, just don't think, don't forget about the goalkeeper. They're the only player on the pitch that can play in a different way. So make sure they're still involved. Um, let players explore, guide their attention. So again, if they're not being as creative as you want them to be, you might need to guide them towards what other opportunities there are to explore. Always provide encouragement. Um, they're going to try things. They're going to want to try things, especially if you work with younger players and you never truly know what they've seen or what they're thinking. So make sure it's a safe space. Make sure the outcomes you're going for are quite clear, but you still give them that encouragement to go after them. And have fun. You know, th th hopefully this webinar is, you know, got you thinking and got your brain sort of ticking over different ideas that you might try to bring about things in your own context. Have fun trying things out. It's really important. So a workshop sort of summary. The importance of culture and recognising the culture you create. We know that will impact the bandwidth of opportunities, technical options, technical skills we want our players to practice. Creativity often comes from order. It's breaking order or seeing an opportunity that no one else has seen before. Technical exploration, keyword exploration, let players explore. You know, unlock the players' thoughts and imagination. You know, young people are naturally imaginative. Sometimes we unintentionally take that imagination away, use it to your advantage. Designing free play to your sessions as well. So if we want players to practice things without consequence, actually step away as a coach sometimes. Do you, is anyone here deliberately designing 15 minutes of free play, 10 minutes of free play where no one's getting involved? You're still making sure they're safe, but you might ask them, can you try these things we looked at? And I'm just going to, I'm just going to make sure you're safe and not get involved. That links into the role of the coach. What you say, how you act, what you do is going to have an impact on how creative your players are willing to be. Obviously, there are other things that influence that, you know, their parents, their, other, their school life, their mates, et cetera, et cetera. But you have a really key part to play. You're the key attachment figure at that club. Trade-offs. So if I'm going to do something, what am I trading off? And if I understand the trade-offs, then I am a much better coach for it because I know what I'm losing and I know what I'm gaining try not to just do something for the sake of it and not consider what you might lose because the more you appreciate the detail that goes behind why you do what you do the better you'll become as a coach and then the step framework how we can use space task equipment and players and we can manipulate them and the messages we send to the players to bring about different options so thanks everyone for today that sort of comes to the end so um, next workshops using constraints 23rd of Feb and we've got more coming up in March and I guess just to close as well um, some of you may be familiar with you've seen our workshop calendar on the SSFA website um, we have uh, the Essex Senior Cup final coming up soon on Tuesday the 19th of March and um, really happy to announce that we've got Kenny Brown who's the West Ham Academy United manager um, coming down to show share some insights into the academy environment also his coaching and playing experience as well as um, their views and his views on player development and we've also got a goalkeeper workshop next Monday um, we're booking to close at midday on Monday so if you're interested in coming down to Billericay if you're local to the area come down get involved see how you can involve goalkeepers with a team session so thanks everyone for your time as usual um, we'll be in here for another sort of 10-15 minutes um, if you've got any questions, post them in the Q&A and I will do my best to support. All right, cheers, everyone. Thanks.